What is going on, Cultivate family? I hope you're all having a good week wherever it is that you're listening to this from today. I am coming to you in a relatively good mood today. And some of you might know why. It is because I have finally got my boot, named by you all, Christopher Walken, off. It's no longer on. I haven't worn it for four days. I was initially told because of my ankle fracture, I was going to be in that boot for two months. And then I was given a very generic recovery plan and discharged with no other information. And things started to feel a little bit better over the holiday period. And I started experimenting with just walking around a little bit in the house. And then when I progressed to week four of my rehab plan, I saw a note that says you can actually start to walk without the boot. So I did take it off. It was a day early, but don't tell anyone. And yeah, I've been walking and training for the last few days, absolutely boot free. And so far, so good. I was almost even scared to tell anyone because I didn't want to jinx it, but I've done a couple of training sessions. Obviously, I've not gone for a big run or I'm not doing any jumping, but it's feeling good. And I'm just slowly testing what it can do, what causes discomfort alongside my rehab at the moment. So I'm going to build it up nice and slowly. And what's been cool about this whole experience is that it's just taught me how easily training is adaptable. And there's always something that we can do. And since I fractured my ankle, I've actually ended up working with a couple of other clients that have either ankle or foot injuries. And you know how people are like, oh, you you get back the energy that you put out into the world. If me putting out content of me doing, you know, seated ski erg or being on the assault bike in my boot inspired a couple of people to reach out for help and figure out what they can do in the gym whilst navigating an injury, that was a really nice thing to come out of it for sure. Now, obviously, I'm going into 2024 with a view of building absolutely ferociously strong ankles and feet because after a couple of ankle injuries in the last year, it's very clear that I need to strengthen everything as much as possible. So as well as doing all of my rehab and doing a lot of research on how I can have really strong feet, really strong ankles, so none of this happens again, I actually invested in some Vivo Barefoot shoes. And this has led me into the cult of barefoot shoes, which is absolutely a thing. And so many people love them and are really passionate about them because they've obviously helped a lot of people. And when I bought mine, I just couldn't stop thinking about the fact that they just don't look very nice. And I've always thought about getting a pair, but the look has always put me off. But now the want to have strong functioning feet and ankles and being able to have a tool that will actually help me get there, I took the plunge and I used my friend's discount code and got a pair. And everyone told me that my calves would feel really weak or my feet would hurt afterwards. But what I knew from my Achilles rehab is that I have strong as fuck calves because of all the heel raises and calf presses I had to do in that rehab. So they've actually been really comfy. And I know that a lot of people are kind of interested in them. So I thought I'd give you my two cents. I feel like for training in the gym and for going on walks, they are actually really, really handy. They don't feel like a hindrance in any way. And obviously the fact that they are wide and allow your toes to spread out is really, really good for like those big compound movements. So I'm looking forward to like getting back into them. But yeah, they are not the prettiest, but I have been enjoying them. I think I'm a convert, but I don't think I'm going to be headfirst into the barefoot shoes cult anytime soon. So that's where I'm at at the moment. The boot is off. I've got some barefoot shoes and I'm back training and I've had a really busy couple of weeks, but I'm feeling good, I think. This week on my Substack, I decided to write about self-belief and I wanted to unpack that a little bit further with you all today because the one thing I see in myself that I also see in a lot of people that I work with is that I naturally have never had a great amount of self-belief. I am a person who's naturally programmed to think that I can't do things. And I know that there's a lot of other people that struggle with that as well because I, I work with a lot of them. And for me, I'm not sure where it stemmed from really. I thought maybe it might be a lifetime of being told 
what I can't do or what I can't be in terms of my like career or my gender expression or my sexuality. Maybe it's spending a huge portion of my life living with depression. I was diagnosed very early with it. And I had really low self-esteem and the mixture of the two definitely doesn't make for great self-belief. And it's held me back in lots of aspects of my life until, you know, maybe the last few years. I almost feel like I've cracked the formula and understand myself a little bit better these days, which by the age of 32, I'd like to hope I had. So what I want this episode today to explore is how we can do hard things despite struggling with our own self-belief. We just need proof that we can do it. And I've been reading a lot recently around the idea that we need to build our self-belief ourselves. We need to build a massive stack of evidence proving that we are capable of achieving the things that we want to. And self-belief isn't just like a state of being or a thing that we randomly wake up with. It actually begins with building some evidence and taking action as opposed to just trying to manifest it or make plans and hope that you kind of just figure it out as you go. And I think the other thing that ties into it is actually knowing you are capable. Like when was the first time you really knew you were capable of doing anything? I think for me, the first time that I knew I was capable of doing something big or something hard or something really transformative was when I dropped out of school because I hated it. And all my friends had like college plans and dreams and goals for careers. And I just didn't share any of that. All I was interested in was like playing music. And I found it really weird that I didn't feel driven to any particular career path. I just wanted to be in a band. And the pressure that that put on me, that if I dropped out, it's going to put me behind everyone else in life. And it was instilled in me that you're not supposed to quit things. But what if the thing that you want to quit really just isn't working for you? It's the wrong thing. And and what I've learned since is that Quitting something can actually be really great, especially if you've realized it's the wrong thing for you. Sticking something out that doesn't serve you or doesn't run in line with your values, it's it's not the one. And I ended up getting offered a place at Leeds College of Music and I left my school in Hull to go and live in Leeds alone. And I needed a lot of help, but I did manage to do it and I did get there. And I think that was the first time for me I realized I could make a massive choice to transform my life and leave something behind and pursue something that was new and different without failing or without it going terribly wrong. And that was the first time I really knew I was capable. And a little bit of self-belief snuck in there and has definitely followed me around ever since when I've made all my other bigger decisions in life. And when I think about why I just didn't have that self-belief in myself to go for it in the first place, I think that maybe we're programmed to think that we have to stick at everything we do in a certain box. And that can often lead us into not believing that we're capable of doing anything else. Now in the UK, you go to school, you do your exams, then you go to college or university, and then you get a job. But that format, that tried and tested format that most people follow, it didn't work for me and it also just doesn't work for so many people, which is why so many of us struggle with it. And I wonder if for a lot of us, especially millennials, Gen Z, we're brought up to follow that path, but we also start to see that we have other options. And sometimes we get made to feel that exploring those options are wrong. And I think that goes hand in hand with people thinking that they can't make changes for their mental well-being and for their health and fitness or long-term health needs because they've just done the thing that they knew for so long that they're then made to feel either subconsciously or by other people around them or society or external pressures that there's no point in them making that change because they can't do it. And that's where we need to build that evidence that they can 
And that's where I try and help all of my people build that undeniable stack of evidence and proof that they can do these things if they want to. Another time I really knew I was capable and believed in myself through crafting evidence was the amount of times that I've moved around or changed careers or had multiple jobs and not just sticking to one. Because I always got told to stick to one thing, be really good at one thing. But for a lot of us, especially the neurodiverse of us, that doesn't always fit. That doesn't work well for us in our brain. A lot of the time we like to mix things up. We like variety. We like to do a little bit of everything. And the idea of a dual career was never, ever positioned or mentioned to me. But when you think about it, pretty much everyone in the creative industry has dual careers. Because often we pursue a really, really big thing that's really, really hard. And we need something to supplement that so we can make a living. And that's a dual career. But people think that having a job alongside being in a band or having a job alongside an acting career isn't valid or it doesn't count. And I know so many creatives that work in bars, in coffee shops, as dog walkers, or I know people in bands that also work in the healthcare system or have office jobs. And people think that isn't valid or they also think that the job has to be the main thing. But really when we think about it, all of these people that have these incredible dual careers because they're creatives, they've built the evidence and the self-belief that they're able to do that. And people will see them and think, oh, I couldn't do that. But for those people, they can. And they built the evidence and the self-belief that that was a possible thing for them. And I'm now here in a dual career as a coach and as a musician. And it's the best choice I ever made for myself. But years and years ago, I didn't believe that that was even an option of me ever being able to succeed in it. And I think my idea of success was very different to what it is now. My idea of success now is being able to pay my rent, being able to enjoy my training, being able to play music and being able to hang out with my dog Aubrey and my partner, my little family. The idea of success for me is just doing something that I love and that I'm really passionate about. And I just never had the self-belief I could do it until I did it. But the problem that I had is I always waited for an extreme moment to creep up on me out of nowhere and to shock me into making a change. I never felt like I had the self-belief to just do it off my own back until more recent years. And that really made me wonder, why is it so instilled in us that we can't do loads of things? Is it passed down through generations or is it within? Our Western culture, believing in ourselves, is sometimes also confused with being too overconfident or cocky. So I know this has been a slightly different flavor to the usual today, but I wanted to give you a couple of prompts to go away with. And the main one is, what self-belief do you wish you had to do a hard thing right now? Are you wanting to start your transition? Are you wanting to quit your job or start a new hobby or try a new thing? Are you feeling like you want to leave a toxic relationship, start a new career path, do some sort of fitness competition, run a marathon, but you're lacking the self-belief to take the first step? The first step in you building that self-belief is to decide the first action that's going to get you closer to doing that hard thing. So here are four steps to build that self-belief. The first is to identify what the hard thing is that you want to do. The second is to decide what little actions you want to take to start building your evidence. The third thing is to go get that evidence, go start making it. And the last step is just to prove everyone, including your brain, wrong because you've built that evidence that you can do something. That's where our self-belief is coming from. We like proof. We like knowing that something's going to work. But sometimes we just have to do something small that builds a little bit of proof and that gives us the self-belief to do a little bit more next time. And we're slowly building that bank of evidence and slowly building more self-belief. So thank you for coming on this little exploration of self-belief with me today, Cultivate Family. If you find yourself struggling right now and you do need a little bit of help, 
getting you started or getting you on the path to where you want to be with your health and your fitness and your well-being give me a shout in the form in the show notes tell me a little bit about yourself and let's figure it out i hope you all have an amazing rest of your week and i'll be back next week with another episode take it easy cultivate family i'm out